Welcome to Church Has Left the Building. My name is Brian Phipps. I'm the Next Steps pastor here. The Church Has Left the Building is one of the Sundays out of the year when Westside chooses to worship in places other than these amazing facilities God has given to us. And we might ask the question, why are we doing this? And the answer is important. We leave the building once a year to remind ourselves of who we are. We aren't simply a people who've been called out of this upside down world to begin living right side up with Jesus. We are also people who have been sent out into the world to invite others to join us on this journey with him. And like the church in her earliest years, and like many of our Christian brothers and sisters around the world today, we are going to worship. We are worshiping where we live, where we work, and where we play. And this year, we're going to go back to where every meaningful journey with Jesus begins. We are going to rediscover His first love together. Consider these words from 1 John 4, 19. This is where the author John writes, We love because He, Jesus, first loved us. Did you hear it? Let me say it again. We love because Jesus first loved loved us. And in this one verse, we discover that there truly is an order to loving Jesus. Loving Jesus starts with receiving His love. We love Jesus and we love others, true, but we do it because He loved us first. Loving Jesus isn't first an action. It's a description of Jesus. He is a loving Jesus. So let me ask you a question. Do you know I mean, do you really know that you are loved by Jesus? Do you regularly hear his voice repeatedly saying into your mind and into your soul, I love you, I love you, I love you? Regardless of how you answer this question, I invite you to posture your heart wherever you are and wherever you have been to receive the love of Jesus right now. We're about to head into our living room and hear some amazing first love stories for some people that we all love. And as you listen to these stories, I pray that you will hear Jesus whispering that into your soul the whole time, saying, I love you, Karen. I love you, John. I love you, Frank. I love you. Come on, let's go.
you all can grab a seat. Well, we're telling stories of first love encounters with the love of God. And my first love story goes back to when I was 19 years old. I was rocking an awesome mullet at the time, actually. <laughs> Business in front, partying back. And a uh, little bit of context. I had grown up in a great church, and I heard that God had loved me hundreds and hundreds of times. But when I was 19, I had an encounter with my own belovedness that was so profound, I call it my second conversion. And uh, I was at Taylor University, it was my freshman year. And at the beginning of the first semester, they have what they call a spiritual emphasis week, and they'll bring in an outside speaker. And that year, they brought in this uh, ragamuffin, former Roman Catholic priest who got defrocked because he got married. I think that's great. This guy has a crazy story. Uh, he you know, served on the front line in the Korean War. Uh, at one point in time in his journey, he spent two months in solitude in a cave in Spain to seek out Jesus. At one point in time, he spent six months in a prison in Sweden. And the only person who knew he was innocent of any crime was the warden. He just went to live among the prisoners. Amazing guy. And his theme that week was healing our image of God. And the first day he spoke about what he called the revolutionary, life-changing, history-shaking image of God that Jesus came to reveal to us. And he says it's in these four letters, A, B, B, A, Abba, mm -hmm. that Jesus came to show us the true face of God as our Abba. And uh, I'd grown up in the church. Um, but that particular title for God had never been brought to the surface. And he explained that, you know, when a baby speaks for the first time around nine to 12 months, typically in the English language, the first word is da, 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 da. And for an Aramaic speaking baby in the first century, the first word out of a baby's mouth is a, ah, a, ah, abba. So Jesus came to actually teach us to pray in baby talk. And that this this God who is almighty and infinite and transcendent, creator and sustainer of all that is, that we're invited to come to him with the same kind of confidence and trust and familiarity that a little toddler has when they run toward their father and scream, Daddy. And he spoke with the power of the Spirit and with this eloquence that left me literally thunderstruck. And for me, it was this moment where God just pulled this veil back on my heart. And my family, like the pain that was in our family system, the particular way we dealt with it was perfectionism. So when I was 13 and I surrendered my life to Jesus, I took all those kind of, um, all, all that kind of urgency, drivenness towards perfectionism and just set it down inside of that religious context, you know? So like I was going to memorize more verses than anybody, study the Bible forwards and backwards. I mean, whatever the metric was. And in that moment, I suddenly could see that I've been doing all these right things for the wrong reasons, that I've been primarily driven by fear and insecurity. Um, and I just felt completely undone. And then I realized I had this image of God where I was just exhausting myself with all this sort of performance behaviorism to try to get a, a smile forced onto this stern face of God. That was my life. And it broke me. Like he got done talking, the whole auditorium cleared out. Probably an hour later, I was still sitting in stunned silence. And I remember the janitor, he made his way up and he's like, you all right? And I was like, no. And he was a very compassionate guy. He's like, well, you have to leave now. <laughs> so I got up and left and I wandered back to the dining commons at Taylor and there's a lake behind it and I put my back up against that brick wall and I remember I felt a lot like the elder brother I was actually mad at God you know it's like man I've been doing all these things and there's this whole you know mass confusion about who you are in my life that I didn't see until this moment and I was like I have to know you this way and I have to know you this way now, you know? And I remember saying to God, I'm not going to leave here until I experience this. And God was, I'm like fuming and venting. And he just, I could hear him say to me, be still, you know? And uh, for the first time, I, I climbed up into the lap of my Abba and put my head on his chest. And um, 
I had a mystical experience that I can't really explain. It was um, like all the best versions of love I've ever experienced, like the love of a parent, the love of a best friend, you know, your actual first romantic love. It was like all of those loves combined times a thousand. And it was like the veil between heaven and earth disappeared and I was just swallowed in this love. And uh, that was my second conversion. And then it was interesting because it, was, it wasn't like it faded out and then there was this warm glow. It turned off. It was like someone turned a switch and just stopped. And I was freaked out. I was like, I, I, immediately I'm like, was that real or did I imagine that? Or, you know, and I started talking to God again. I was like, God, I need to know that was legit. Like I need a <laughs> sign, you know? Um, anyone ever prayed a sign prayer? Right. Yes, the rest of you are liars. We've all done that, right? And I was like, God, I need a sign. You know, and I wasn't getting a sign. And then I did this thing. I grew up in a big Bible church, you know, and we have been taught never play that Russian roulette Bible game, you know, where you're like, God, speak to me and do this number. I was like, so desperate. I'm like, I'm doing Russian roulette. Here we go. You know, and I remember I flipped through and I put my finger down and I looked at it and it literally said, you asked for a sign, not out of belief, but unbelief. And I was like, all right, I don't want that one. So I started flipping again. I did. I put my finger down again. And it was Jesus' words to the paralytic. He said, pick up your mat and go home. And I was like, whoa. And that started, that was 30 years ago. And there's been this um, constant repentance in my life. uh, Away from that addiction to performance and He's slowly rewiring me and um, reordering me to rest in the fact that like my true identity, first love shows me my true identity. And it's not something I earn or strive for, it's a gift. And, uh, and Paul talks about this. He says this in uh, Romans 8 verse 14, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought your adoption as children. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And that's my story. I'm Abba's little boy. That's who I am. You unravel me with the melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave. Oh, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Lord, I am a child of God. my mother's womb you have chosen me oh love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave Oh, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Lord, I
am your child You brought me in Out of the cold You cleaned me up, Lord And you dusted me off And you called me son Oh, oh, oh. And you called me daughter Lord, I belong to you. Oh, Lord, I belong to you. Yes. Oh, I belong to you. Oh, Lord, I belong to you. My great So first love taught me my freedom. And if you aren't careful, there's something really interesting that happens in our culture. As a young kid, everyone has to go through school and everyone has to go through each grade, which means that you have to take tests, which means that you have to perform. And if you wanna get to first grade to second grade, you have to pass a test. You have to be smart, you have to know the material. If you wanna get from high school to college, you have to take a test and you have to be good enough. You have to be smart enough. You have to perform a certain way to be able to get to the places you wanna go. And I remember that that was, that was a hard concept for me. You know, and even, even as an athlete, I played soccer and basketball and I, I did those things for basically my whole life. But there's even an element of, are you good enough to make the team? Because you still have to perform. You still have to go out for the tryouts. You still have to have the skill set. You still have to have the talent level. And if you don't, then you're not on the team. You literally can't get on the team unless you're good enough. And I remember going into college and, you know, my identity was riding on, can I pass the test? Can I make the grade? And am I good enough? Even in the dating relationships, 
You know, are you pretty enough? It's the pretty girls that get the, the guys. It's, it's the girls that are charismatic enough that get the guys. It's the extrovert girls that are flaunting themselves that get the guys. And I remember just thinking, man, I have to perform a certain way in order to get a certain result. And so I remember I just kind of ran thin with that. And so I graduate college and, and the Lord really took soccer away from me and, and in a miraculous way, but I didn't really see it miraculous at the time. And I get into my first few years of ministry and I just kind of hit this roadblock where, you know, if I don't have a perfect conversation with a student, if I don't know how to answer a question, which high school students will reveal everything you don't know about the Bible instead of things you do know about the Bible. And so there was a lot of these days that I just kept feeling insecure. I mean, I was a psychology major. I didn't set out to be in ministry but God put me there. And so I started to feel this pressure and, and really it was debilitating for my ministry. It was debilitating even just me functioning as a human being. And I remember, you know, just physically feeling in the spiritual realm just chains on me. And I'm thinking, man, this Christianity thing is really hard. I don't know if I'm cut out for this either. I mean, I can maybe pass a test here and there, and I can maybe get on a good college soccer team, but am I actually cut out for this Jesus thing? And I remember I just had a really bad day in ministry, and I just felt like everyone hated me and everyone was looking down on me. And I remember I went back to my room that night, this little apartment in Olathe, and I said, God, I'm a failure. I'm such a failure. And God, I'm so sorry that I'm a failure. I just fail all the time. I'm not good enough for this. I can't, I can't do this anymore. And I remember, as I'm telling God that I'm a failure, I'm a failure, I'm a failure, I'm a failure, I'm sorry I'm not good enough, God. I remember God saying, I love you. 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 And every time I would say, God, but no, I'm a failure. Don't you understand? I'm telling you, I'm not good enough for this. I, I can't pass the test every time. I can't perform like this anymore. I'm tired. I'm in my year two of ministry and I'm supposed to be doing this thing for my whole life and I can't do it. I'm done at year two and it's supposed to be like 50 years and I'm done at year two. That's not good statistically. I'm gonna be another person that burns out in ministry. And he said, I love you. I love you. I love you. I lo he wouldn't say anything else and it was infuriating me. And so I thought, well, maybe I'm missing the point then. And so I cry myself to sleep and I wake up. And I thought, what am I missing with this thing? And so I, I didn't do the Russian roulette with my Bible. I got on Google because um, that's what I knew how to that's do. Better. That's because you're younger than me. Yes. <laughs> got on my phone, I got on my computer and I was kind of dual purposing it. And, uh, and I remember looking up every single scripture of love that I could find. Because if he was telling me that I, he loved me, then I had to be missing something with the love. And so I was reading different verses and I was waiting for one that really struck me until I got to Song of Songs. And in Song of Songs 2, 4, it says, he escorts me to the banquet hall. It's obvious how much he loves me. In another translation, it says, the banner over me is love. And what I realized is that the banner over me is love. The banner over me was never, pass the test, Becca. The banner over me was never, well, if you're not talented enough, Becca, I'm not gonna love you. The banner over me was, you have to be pretty enough in order to be in the kingdom. I only take pretty people. That's not the test with God. The test with God is that can we allow him to take us into the banquet hall? Because if you read this, it's the young woman that's saying it, which would be equivalent to the bride of Christ. Can we let Jesus take us to the banquet hall? And can we let him wine and dine us? Can we let him lavishly say what he wants to say to us? And when he talks to us, he's not gonna say, you really screwed up on that, Becca. You really screwed up on that one too. What he's gonna say is, man, I've been waiting to tell you how much I love you. And the interesting thing about this is that I don't think the banner ever leaves us. It can't. It's a permanent banner over us. 
And it's not a banner of performance. It's not a banner of rejection. It's not a banner based on anything that we could ever do. It's separate from us. The banner was given to us based on what he thinks about us. And that's it. And all the times that I tried to put, I'm unworthy is my banner over me. He said, no, you don't get to put the banner over you. I get to place it. And it's love. It's not performance. It's not rejection. It's not your sins. It's not the ways that you don't feel good enough. It's not the days that you're on your down and out and worst times. It's love. And once I started walking in that, ministry wasn't as difficult. This Christian faith actually made a lot more sense because it's in my failures that I can realize I'm still loved. It's in my times where I screw up conversations or it's in my times where I don't know enough about scripture and I just don't feel qualified that day. It's in that times where I'm just kind of speechless at what I see going on in the world that I can sit back and I say, no, the banner over me is love and I'm staying there. I'm not gonna try to put something else over me. I'm gonna sit in the banquet hall. I'm gonna let him give me blessings that he wants to give. I'm gonna let him speak over me. And every single time, that's gonna be how much he loves me. And for me, that's a really secure place. And for me, that love set me free. Jesus, as we're together, your word tells us you make a table before us. Your cup runs over, you lavish on us your love, you call us sons and daughters. God, whatever, whatever banners we're holding over ourselves tonight, every day that we wake up, Every moment we turn our eyes from you. May we surrender them to you. And just fix our eyes on you. And let you cover us with that I love you.
Well, my first love showed me something that has been said already. If you saw my picture growing up in the yearbook and you went to the same school as I did, and you would uh, say, okay, that's Casey, and you would say, Casey was a good kid. You know, he knew all the rules, he never got in trouble, he um, excelled in things that he did. He, I was a pastor's kid, so I grew up in a pastor's home, I grew up in church, knew all the rules, knew everything, um, never misbehaved. It was just, that, that was who I was. Um, I grew up knowing that uh, I'd be going into ministry and I in, ended up in ministry. And I remember growing up and even going through high school before I ever even got to ministry. And there was this, this sense that um, I had to earn something with God. I almost had to, um, like it's been said, perform. I almost had to, to, to do all the rules and hit all the tick marks in order to get God to love me. And I remember the, what that did to me is I, I, would, I remember going to bed at night and thinking, God, if there's anything that I did that would have caused you not to love me today, 
would you forgive me? And I would go to bed every night. And it's not that my dad taught this way. It's not that our church believed this way. This is just how I imposed who God was. And this is how my belief system I created, even though I knew what scripture said, even though I knew what Jesus said about love. But this is what I went to bed fearing every night that if I didn't do everything right, he wouldn't love me. And the fear that I would live under just created a pressure. And I, would, I was in ministry and I'd still have this mentality. And I love God, I love this, but I felt like I had to earn God's love for me. And it came through my behavior. It came through my perfectionism and that's how it came out. And I remember growing in understanding God's grace that was empowered by his love. And as I began to grow in knowing his grace, it wasn't an epiphany, it was just this gradual understanding that you can't earn it. You just can't earn it. And I remember at one moment, I can't remember where it was or what time frame it was, but I was, I was in a, a, a church as a music minister at the time and I remember sitting in a chair and sitting back and God just telling me, speaking to my heart, Will you just receive it? Will you just receive it? I'm not asking you to earn it. I'm not asking you to tick off some boxes and open this love box and by your performance, you do enough good and all of a sudden you, you get my love. I just want you to receive it. And I, I remember at that moment thinking, oh, I've missed it this entire time. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I try to earn God's love even after I've had that moment. Like, God, I, I, still, I, I still need to do enough good because I need you to love me. Or I need, I need this, I, I need you to love me. And, and, and for whatever reasons we do this, God stands over us, like it's been said, it's a banner. Like it's been said, you don't have to be perfect for it. And he just looks to you and I, and he just says, will you just receive it? I love what John says when he writes and he's kind of trying to figure out how to talk about Jesus and he begins his writing there in John 1, and he gets to this verse 12, and he says, yet to all who receive him, to them that believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. There was no behavior involved there. There was no, I have to earn something, which is what everything I wanted to do, and I wanted to earn my right standing with him. I wanted to. I felt like that's what everything has kind of driven me toward. But he said, will you just receive it? And as I begin to look at that scripture, and, and as I begin to just explore that, that word is almost like, it's, it, it's as if God's reaching out his hand to you and I, and he's just asking you and I to take his hand, and that's all he wanted me to do. He just wanted me to take his hand. He just wanted me to receive his love. And that's a lot like a gift, isn't it? Have you ever been to a party where you felt like maybe it was a housewarming party and you felt obligated to bring a gift? <laughs> or have you ever been in a situation where someone gave you something but you felt obligated to give something back? I felt like that was how God wanted his love. It was almost like a business transaction. It was almost like, okay, you're going to give me this, but you want something in return. And, and really all he wanted in return was just me to receive it. That's the best way I could respond to his love. And I think a lot of times we get into this mode that we feel like, oh, you, you've done all of this for me. I need to do this, all this for you. And no, you don't. All you have to do is just simply say, I'm gonna give up trying to earn it. I'm just gonna reach out my hand, lift up my hand, whatever the posture it is, and Jesus, I'm just gonna receive it. I'm gonna receive you as my first love. 
I want to receive the fact that I don't have to live the perfect life that I feel is required because you came and lived that perfect life. I don't have to pay for anything in my past that maybe I did something wrong and I don't feel like I have to go back and make up for that and pay for that just to be right with you. All I have to do is just receive your love. And I remember almost like the light switch changed in me. That as soon as I got out of that earning it with God, I, it's almost like I had to earn something like to get this wage of love. Something clicked on the inside of me and there was a joy. Something clicked on the inside of me and everything that I had done before to earn God's love, it, I continued to do, but there was a different motivation behind it. And to kind of put it in our language, there was a compelling drive inside of me to love Jesus in return. And there was a, there was a force inside of me now that that first love had revealed to me his love. And now his love was just like a, a, a force in me that was now wanting me to become like Jesus. And I wanted to become like Jesus, not to earn something back from God, but because I've received his love now, I just want to be like his son, Jesus. And then there's this compelling, compelling drive to serve people around you. And I remember when my motivation used to be to serve others, to say, hey, God, you see that? Do you love me? No, it's not that. It's this compelling force that says, God, you show me how much you love me. How can I not serve the people around me. See, first love showed me that I can't earn it. I can only put my hands out, look to him, and every day receive it. That's my prayer for you. Grow in that. Receive it. Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change One thing remains One Never. 
started this whole night in 1 John where this profound statement is made and it's we love because he first loved us. Now I know Becca and I know Rob and I know Casey and you people, you're just crazy in love with Jesus and I think tonight you've helped us kind of get an idea as to why because he took all the brokenness, all the pain, all the striving and he loved you on top of it. You can't help but to love him back. So here's a question I have for all of us here and all of us gathered in wherever you are around the world. I want to ask you the question. You buy it? You believe it? More than that, have you received it? Because here in all this, isn't really what it's about. It's have you opened your hand and taken it and felt it. Because if you're sitting here thinking, that's good for all those folks sitting around the couches there. But for me, for whatever reason, I'm not qualified. This part's for you. There was a prostitute caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus said, I love you. There was a tax collector wrapped up in money, wrapped up in himself. Jesus said, I love you. It's a man named Saul that was out breathing murderous threats, the book says, against Jesus and his people. And you know what he said to him, to him, even him, I love you. If you haven't heard it tonight, I encourage you right now, close your eyes and picture whatever you think Jesus' face looks like right now. Just close your eyes, see him. And I hope that you can see the smile and the joy on his face as he writes the banner over your head right now. I love you. I love you. I love you. And it will never stop. It goes on and on and on until you join me for eternity in the home that I've created for you. Jesus, we receive your love tonight. We just receive. We receive the grace. We receive the forgiveness. We receive the hope. More than anything, Jesus, we receive and we welcome you. Thank you for loving us and pursuing us so that everything that comes back out of us is just a sacrifice of gratitude and love and appreciation for who you are. 
And we ask this prayer in your mighty name that God's people together said, amen. All right, one last thing before we go. We're gonna be talking an awful lot this coming year about first love. In fact, we're gonna get crazy about this thing called first love. And we're going to be talking first love. Jesus loved us first. Jesus loved us first. Jesus loved us first, all over. But not just on the weekend. We're going to encourage it in our small groups as well. And so here's what we need. We need about 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 of you to say, I am willing to help people in response to the love Jesus has given to me. I want to create an environment in my home or in a coffee shop that I know of or my place of business where I have a conference room, whatever it is, I want to step up and help other people experience the love of Christ. We're going to be recruiting brand new hosts to have brand new host groups or uh, temporary life groups starting in February. And what we need to do during this first part of January and the rest of the month is start asking people that are, that have a heart for people that can open their home or their place, that can serve a few snacks, and that can turn on a DVD. We're going to have some fantastic material that you can work through that will actually go along with the message series starting at that time. If you're interested in being a host, you don't have to know what all happens. You just need to be able to walk with a mentor one step at a time. We're going to provide those people to walk in and hand with you for that. Here's all we need you to do if you have any interest at all. Please just go online to westsidefamily.church forward slash host. That'll take you to an application form. And when you send that to us, one of our team will follow up with you and just start taking you step by step through the process. Lots and lots of people, hundreds literally have done this in the past and have made great friends and have grown in their intimacy and their love for Christ. Join us in this. We need you to. God bless you.